So I'm very happy that the global donor platform picked this area of involvement, and that's the position of women in the value chain in agriculture. Why do I think this is important? Because I don't think we can tolerate today that there are too many people which go to bed hungry and children which are stunted, whilst we know that women take a central role in food and nutrition security. So how do we do that? The answer is, of course, we need to bring more women in the core of food and nutrition solutions. So why should we do that? Why should we do that? Well, there are three reasons. First of all is that women are involved in more than half the production of food in the world. Secondly is they contribute to more than half the labor in agriculture. And last but not least, we know that if you involve women in this field here, that the increased production will improve livelihood of people and children are better fed. That's a given. We don't, much, we don't need much more science than actually to do so. So if we know that, of course, and I go back to this, uh, to this title here, the relevance of gender in food systems that you see here, do we need to talk about the relevance of food gender? I would prefer to talk about the business case. What is the business case of gender in food systems? So what we need to ask the question is what do people need and what people want? These are two different questions, but equally important. What do people need and what do people want? Secondly, you need to ask your question is what is feasible and what is possible? And finally, is it what is it what you, the donor community, are going to do when you go home? What is it what you're going to do individually and preferably collectively? on this particular issue. I believe there is a serious business case here. It is a, what we need to do is we need to build a chain of return on investment on that. It is a business case which goes beyond a social obligation because we know there is a business opportunity. And I relate that to an area I work for. I work for business and then for the government. And you can rest assured the issue of nutrition on the agenda only came about while there were three things developed. First of all, the science was clear on the relationship between food, nutrition, health. Secondly, there was a global leadership through the Scaling Up Nutrition, you heard it before, the Sun Initiative. And thirdly, most importantly, people found out that investing in nutrition makes economic sense. Well, that's the part which starts working. So if you are able to verify and, and have evidence that investing in women empowerment makes economic sense, there is where you will find people on your site, in particular also the business side. We have a panel of three today here. And we'll start at three different areas in here. First, we'll start with uh, Natalie Mescope. Mescope, can I say that right? And she looks to the gender dynamics, what's happening in a household between men and f male and female and their children. So what are the dynamics in a household? And what is the impact on food and nutrition security? That's an important part because we can have talks, as I said before, at the government level, but you need to go back down to the grassroots level, is how do we build change early on in that particular field? Secondly is Mario Lavazzo. He lives and talks coffee again. It is his life. And I wanted to hear from you, Mario, is what role does gender actually play in the coffee value chain? And if we learn that, of course, then we turn to Agnes Quisumbi from IPRI. She has taken on board what's said by the previous two speakers. And she will then look to the gap which is there, and how to bridge that gap between the gap between where women are today and where they need to be tomorrow. 
and how this gap is going to be closed on that. So I asked the panel members clearly is if you would take, because we have in total 45 minutes, I already picked five myself here, I said the chairman should be allowed here, is to three to five minutes, it was difficult, Natalie said to me, five minutes I may need ten. I said, well, try to make three. Why? Because the people are interested in simple, clear messages from you with the experience as to what is the only thing they're going to take home to practice. Natalie, you, the first five minutes, three to five minutes. Thank you so much, Paulus. And uh, my name is Natalie Mesope, and I'm from the Global Center for Food System Innovation at Michigan State University. So it's one of the USAID Higher Education Solutions Network. There are actually eight laboratories um, in the US, and um, seven in the US and one in Africa. So basically, the objective or the goal of our center is to create, test, and scale innovative solutions to food system challenges that are brought about as a result of the global trends of rapid urbanization, climate change, pressure on land, and um, you know, changes in land use patterns and increases in population. So gender is a cross-cutting theme within the Global Center for Food System Innovation, and we are the only laboratory that is focusing on food system innovation. So at the Global Center for Food System, we believe that and we recognize that the objective of improving food security as well as um, improving nutrition cannot be achieved without empowering women. From the point of view of innovations, we also believe that gender issues could potentially accelerate or inhibit food system innovation. So how do we do it within the center? So basically, we issue out innovation grants to um, different groups of people and uh, that are targeting the challenges to the food system that are posed by the global trends of ra rapid urbanization, climate change, pressure on land, and so on and so forth. And then secondly, we also conduct um, gender-specific research, and the objective of that is to be able to inform innovative solutions to food system challenges. So basically, we value gender analysis as a critical component of the food system innovation cycle. So with the grantees, we do a lot of things. So basically, the first thing that we do is we try as much as possible. We do not want generic proposals. So there are a lot of people who can say so many things about the role of women in agriculture. 70% of the labor in agriculture is contributed by women, but you know, there are a lot of proposals also that are, people are paid these days to gender the proposal in court. So the first thing that we do is we require that the grantees should establish the relevance of gender to the plant intervention or the plant innovation, which is quite often a very big challenge because um, very few people, um, you know, everybody can say that women play a dominant role in agriculture, but it's something else to establish the relevance of gender to the work that you're doing. The key question is, is gender relevant to this innovation? So secondly, we require that the proposals or the grantees should demonstrate a very, very solid understanding of the social context for which the innovation is planned, because we believe that it's very critical. And then thirdly, we expect that the grantees should be able to tell us specifically the pathways through which the innovation is going to contribute to women's empowerment, thereby resulting to outcomes like food security, um, income security, um, uh, as well as nutrition gains for, for everybody within the household. And then we also require that the, in every specific context, what does empowerment look like in the context that you're planning to do your work? How do you hope? What do you understand? How, how do you, what, what are some of those things that you expect to see? Under what circumstances would you say that these people have been empowered? Because this is a very big challenge. Very few people, every proposal has that word empowerment. But to describe empowerment in the context, in that specific context, is quite often a challenge. So it could be, you know, you're trying to increase women's control over income, you know, trying to save their time, you know, you're also trying to help them to play a better or a greater role in making food security decisions within the household. We see this a lot. There's so many projects there um, that are geared towards improving agricultural production, increasing incomes for household that do not necessarily result in improved food security or better nutrition for households. Particul particularly, we just had a case in Malawi where increases in income actually led to men consuming more alcohol rather than spending the money on food. There's so many examples like this, and so these are some of the things that 
we're really interested when we're looking at the proposals, we want the grantee to say specifically and to lay out the pathway. So um, another thing that we, we really require the proposals, you know, empowerment is a very complex word and the different indicators or different dimensions. So we want the grantees to be able to tell us, you know, are there any empowerment trade-offs here? So maybe by saving women's time or improving their, bringing them into income generating activities, you find out that, um, you know, you're increasing their workload. So how do you plan to take care of this trade-off, you know, in the context of your activity? So um, without taking a very uh, much of your time, I think that the three major messages that I want to bring from here, I think it's very important understanding the social context. The second one is lay out specifically the pathway through which your intervention or the innovation is going to result to women's empowerment. And then third, we actually give a lot of priority to what we call high level um, empowerment intervention. So something that a project or an activity whereby addressing gender issues are going to make a significant value added or contributions to the objective of improving food security as well as nutrition within the household. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you very much. The, the Global Center for Food Systems Innovations. Could I ask you a simple question, Natalie? So, could you give us, the audience maybe want to know as to what is the, for example, one example that this innovation has led to more efficient, let's say, uh, uh, more efficient practices in the, on the ground level? Okay, um, sorry. Okay, so here we have a case where um, mobility constraints, so I'll give the problem. So the problem can be broken down into three different parts. So mobility constraints actually limit women's participation in market because they can't take the product to the market. And then the second one is that, you know, they lack bargaining or negotiation skills because they're used to selling as individuals. You have a lot of issues um, related to lack of trust. And then the third one is that they have very low, um, you know, knowledge, understanding of how the market works. So this, the context here is for a, a grain legume. So those are the three characteristics of the problem. So under normal circumstances, very few, many people would start thinking, okay, based on these things, you know, how can we improve access to profitable market? But then we heard earlier on that every time you do that without taking into consideration gender issues, there's a risk that men are going to appropriate that particular activity. So the intended outcome of improving food security or better nutrition might never be achieved. So in this context, you have lack of trust, you have mobility constraint, a solution was as simple as collective activity, bringing the women together, capacity building, um, you know, um, training them on like um, grain processing, you're training them on ways in which they can improve grain quality, you're training them, you're putting them together, you know, empowering them to sell their grain. And that also helps them. So the couple of outcomes here, so the income gains, you know, you bring the market to the women, so that helps to overcome. So the two things, you first organize them collectively, you bring the markets to the women so that they have, they can sell their product directly to the buyer and then they can have control over that income. And we all know that the enormous benefits associated to women having direct control over income, you know, in terms of food security and nutrition. And then lastly, it also saves time. You know, so that's another one critical indicator or aspect of empowerment is whether or not, you know, the, the use of time or women's workload. Because as individuals, every one of them wants to sit by the market and spend the whole day trying to sell two kilograms of, of grain. Meanwhile, when you bring them collectively, they have better, you train them, you know, capacity building. They have better negotiation skills. And then they have more control over income. And that also has potential, you know, huge benefits in terms of, you know, food security and nutrition as well as health. Thank you very much, Natalie. Bringing the markets to the people. That's, a, that's a, I think, a, a good starting point to, to, to overcome, let's say, the distance between production and marketplace. Mario, <laughs> so you're going to talk with us about gender in the coffee system. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I, <coughs> well... Let me first of all say that uh, I, I, I'm very happy and uh, very pleased to be here and I, I learned uh, many things and I'm, I'm here to learn. But uh, the net result is that I changed in the last uh, 
36 hours, about six or seven times my presentation, so <laughs> I keep uh, piling up notes. Uh, so I, but, but this is good for you because I wanted to explain you everything about the Lavazza Foundation, etc., etc., and you have been uh, granted that I will not do that. So I will only focus uh, on, uh, I, I think, two points. One is uh, why for us, and again, I'm here only to uh, tell you our experience. I'm not here to tell you anything right or wrong, good or bad, just our experience. But we st when we started, away. Okay, thank you. When we started about 15 years ago to be involved in, in sustainability project, uh, the, 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 the situation was that we were very much involved in hardware, in doing things, in uh, building houses, in building things, uh, maybe beneficious treatment plant for coffee, etc., etc. Why that? Because the basic assumption was what uh, in our region we say, I'm trying to translate, but is basically a dialect uh, saying, let's don't uh, teach the cats to climb, in the sense that the assumption was that the growers were, of course, great in producing coffee, because they were doing that since uh, hundreds of years, so well, we are just good in roasting coffee, just, uh, you know, boiling a little bit. So, of course, uh, we cannot pretend to go. That was a terribly, enormously wrong assumption. So what happened is that after two, three years, we realized that uh, that was not the case. We, if we wanted to, to do something, we had to develop competence and knowledge to help the people to adapt good agricultural practices, to, to, to do, to do uh, other things, which we did, of course. That was what I said, what I call the second phase. Now, what happened is that uh, we started, uh, more or less a couple of years ago, one year ago, a third phase. And uh, over lunch, I was using this metaphor that I think uh, can be also used uh, for, you know, I can report to you. And it's the following. You can have uh, a great engine, and there was an Italian advertising also in that respect, a great engine. But if you don't have a transmission system that is efficient, you are actually losing the power of the engine. Now. The metaphor means what? It means that in, in our view, in a sustainability project, you need a possible way to, to really have an impact. And in our particular case, if you don't have a gender, let's say, balanced situation, or let's say a gender efficient situation, you are actually losing a lot of the great results that you can, you can reach. In our real case, and uh, George uh, T. Meyer was, uh, was uh, briefly mentioned it this morning. We had a case where we had in, uh, in, in East Africa fantastic results in terms of yield, which was actually two and a half times improved. So of course, uh, in terms of income for the family was, was a great uh, economic success. But what happened is that we realized, and this is what also you were just right now mentioning, uh, these economic resources that didn't really transferred into a, a improvement in the life of the family. So you have to work uh, on the translation mechanism, which is, in our case, is basically a gender situation. So what we think, uh, and this is what we are really now trying to do in all the project, is really to apply the, a family, a household approach into the management of the whole family activities. Let's put it very, very broadly. I don't think uh, it's only an issue of, uh, uh, you know, some of the members doing something, some other of the members doing something else, et cetera, et cetera. But here is really an issue of seeing the family almost as a, let's say, as a balance sheet. You have two sides. You have things to do. You have income to decide how to use it. No? You have uh, opportunity and, and risk. And uh, the more we can bring uh, this decision, this activity in the family context, hopefully, the more we will have a better results in our, in our project. Let me, if I can have another one, in one minute, can I? Okay. Half a minute. Half a minute. Make it very short. Uh, two years ago, I was in India where we were uh, launching a company, not a cooperative, a company, because the people wanted a company, about 500 members owning the company. And we helped them to set up the company. The company is, was supposed, and is basically doing services for the people uh, quality control on coffee. Um, purchasing of uh, inputs, etc., etc., etc. A lot of things. I, I need more time to go in detail. But uh, what was for me a, a, an interesting, an interesting experience is that I was, uh, you know, kind of, a, you know, had to supposed to get, deliver a speech and say something. So for me, it was natural to, to, to in one of the visit, the village, uh, I was there to, to, to explain the people what for us was the value of the gender that we were 
hoping that you know the whole family was participating, etc., etc., etc. So it was very theoretical <laughs> uh, speech. And then uh, after everything was to say the official part was finished, a guy came to me and he said, "Oh, but this is not possible." I said, "Why? Because she and she was his wife steals the coffee." Now. She steals the coffee, which is, which is again, something that George was mentioned to her, is a normal practice. But the point uh, to me is not that uh, if the wife was, was or not stealing the coffee. She was actually stealing the coffee to get some money for, for the kids, for the doctor, etc. But that's not the point. The point is that, to me, is not enough to say, do something. You need time to change uh, the, the, the mentality. It's a dramatic change. It's not so easy. Me, because actually here is a donor, <laughs> is a donor assembly. I am, I'm a donor because we use uh, our own resources in the project. I am also a donor. Now the question is, and, and uh, you know, in one of the preparation of this meeting, the point was let's uh, also ask provocative questions. Now, my provocative question to all of you is, we all agree that this is some of the area where we want to go. We may all easily agree on the results, but what is the pace? Should we say tomorrow morning, for me as a donor, I can do it very easily. I want only women in the cooperative. Very easy to do it. If you want to use my resources, this is a condition, easy, one second. Is that correct? Do we want to do it tomorrow morning? Do we have to say that we do it in three years, five years? So what is the pace? The results may be clear, but what is the pace we want to go? What is the speed? What is the situation? Because, of course, I assume that is specific on the specific situation, the specific country. What is the speed we want to go in that direction? I think this is a big challenge. Sorry for the time. It's good to see that people are passionate about their work. Uh, so, thank you very much, Mario. I may come back late because what I just wanted to go to, uh, to, to, uh, to Agnes is to, well, the question is, late, not now, but think about it, how does this play out in the family? Are those families more food and nutrition secured in this program than they were before? Do you look at it? Do you measure that? Because that would be one of the outcomes, of course, of empowerment of women within the household. So Agnes, let's talk about the index. So you looked at the index and how would it play out? How do we fix this gap we're all talking about here? And what message are you giving to the audience here? The single message they could take home of what they're going to do. So thank you, Paulus, for the introduction. And thank you very much for the invitation to speak on this panel. Um, IFPRI is not a member of the Global Donor Platform. But we like to think that we help to build the evidence base, which gives policy alternatives for donors to act on in their own programming. So we also thank our donors, many of whom are here, for giving us and for investing in the evidence base, which I hope I can talk about today. Um, I think one of the key issues that has emerged um, in today's discussion is how difficult it is to empower women because it is a multi-dimensional thing. There are many dimensions of empowerment. Um, and if you cannot really measure empowerment, then how are we going to evaluate whether our programs have been successful? It is very easy, or it's relatively easy, to measure efficiency gains, but it is harder to measure empowerment gains. But if you don't even try to measure empowerment, it is difficult to build a commitment to do it. Many people have said that because empowerment is a subjective thing, it cannot be measured, so let's just give up. I don't think so. If you can measure it, or at least try to measure it in a systematic way, you can at least use it to measure progress. It may be imperfect as a measure, but at least you have some milestones, some guideposts in your journey towards it. So taking the starting point of the need to build the evidence base that donors can use for monitoring the projects, um, the Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index is one possible instrument which was developed by IFPRI and the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, OFI, and USAID to, develop, to measure women's inclusion in agricultural sector growth as part of the Feed the Future Initiative. So USAID commissioned us to, to, to develop this um, index. And I think what's different about the WEA 
as compared to other indicators of empowerment, is that it focuses on the productive domain. It focuses on women's empowerment in agriculture. Now, this does, this does not mean that our other dimensions of empowerment are not important. It's just that it's very rare that empowerment in agriculture has been measured in a systematic way. So I bribed Nancy with chocolate so that I would be allowed to have a slide. Mm. And um, just very briefly, there are five domains which are the different colors on the, on the chart behind me. They comprise production, resources, so access to resources, which we talked about earlier, um, decision-making over income, leadership in the community, and time, and 10 indicators. These data are collected for both men and women in the households. It's an adult male and an adult female. So it, it recognizes that women are not isolated individuals. They live in a context of households. But unlike Forber believes that households just operate as one, we think or we do know that men and women in the household might have very different beliefs and preferences. And it's important to understand this. So using, because and, um, this index is decomposable into the indicators, there are 10 indicators which make up the index, you can identify where the empowerment gaps exist and what policies can be put in place to address them. So we collected, um, so if you want to know more about the Women's Empowerment Index, I'm going to leave a whole stack of this outside. I don't want to bring them back. Um, but we also collected, um, USAID and its partners collected data for 13 countries in the Feed the Future initiative. And the results are presented here in this baseline report, of which I have plenty, please take them, as well as summarized in the graph above. And I think here is the main point. We were able to use the index to identify the areas where there are the biggest gaps in empowerment. And this should not be a surprise to you following the discussion this morning. The biggest gaps are in the access to or decisions on credit. Women do not make enough. They don't have access, enough access to or make enough decisions on credit. Secondly, they do not belong to that many groups. They don't have the opportunity to exercise community leadership and to build social capital because they are in so few groups. And thirdly, they are overworked. And the workload measure here includes both productive and reproductive work. So it's both her work to earn money or to, to produce food for her family, as well as the work that she puts into cooking, fetching f fuel and water, taking care of children. So countries are now using these identified gaps to help design agricultural programs. For example, if is about to work with the Ministry of Agriculture in Bangladesh, to develop a randomized control trial of agriculture, nutrition, and empowerment interventions. We also want to move this work forward to develop empowerment indicators that measure dimensions that are more closely linked to nutrition. So we are, we are not afraid to go beyond the productive domain to look into things like intimate partner violence, um, mobility, which is a constraint for many countries in cultures which have norms of female seclusion, and so on. So I'm, I'm going to stop here, but, say, but just end by saying that um, although these are very initial efforts to measure empowerment, I think it is a step in the right direction because once we start to measure things, we can be more properly be held accountable for them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Agnes. So I, I noted also maybe two things down what you said is to, there are two issues as the building blocks for women empowerment is about access and recognition. Access to land to start with, access to inputs, access to credit. And recognition is a role and position which women have. As a woman, managing a family, as a farmer, as a worker, as a caregiver, as a mother, but last but not least, also as a position with a, as a backbone of economy. So that's a whole rack of things you need to actually be influenced. So the gap is there, but we find solutions slowly to, 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 be, to, be, uh, to be found. 
We have another, let's say, 10 minutes, and I'm coming back. You need to answer your question still, Mario. Eh? To come back to the audience. Could you give a short answer, and then we have 10 minutes to go back to the audience, or would you take that on board with the questions? Who wants to have a question? And then in the meantime, he gives the answer. Yes, thank you. No, the answer, the answer, the answer is, is actually very simple. Unfortunately, the measurement, uh, it, it's a very, very, very difficult area. That is the, really the honest answer. So we do, yes, we do have some measurement uh, in place to measure this, uh, this element, of course, and I share. I agree, it's much more complicated to measure uh, productivity or a uh, physical, physical factor. Uh, what I can tell you is that in our, in our system, as a, as a Lavazza Foundation, but also as the group in the International Coffee Partner, we have a, a very, very critical approach exactly in these very days on the measurement and evaluation uh, system. So we are really trying to develop a better way to, well, actually, before measuring, to gather data. Because, uh, well, the quality of the data that you gather is already a big issue. It's a starting point. So. Yeah. <laughs> step by step, one thing you go home, what you're going to do. What are the questions? In the meantime, I can recall, was a general saying, I'm a general in the army, but all general decisions are taken by my wife. Any quick? You handle that? I see one, more people with the questions. People have been so clear. Yes, Monique, Monique Calon, my colleague. Yes, please. Okay, just very interesting issues you raised, and I think the empowerment, measurement of empowerment is, is very exciting. Begin to do that. I wondered also if the panel had any thoughts about crossover measures, particularly the health, nutrition, agricultural production, because this brings in the whole dynamic of, of women as largely determinants of household and child nutrition on the household scale. But then the competing pressures, if I can put it that way, of, of macroeconomic uh, large-scale commodity food systems that are driving change. We heard mentioned this morning about the, the dilemma of household nutrition versus cheap, low-quality food. Now, mm. should we not be looking at the real cost of those when they're put together rather than just taking the production sector alone? What does the panel think? Thank you. Let's take another two, two or three questions. We all know the question now, isn't it? Panel members, huh? Because this is a question to... Yeah. Okay. Be brief. Be brief. Just one question to Mario. Um, by the way, I, was, I love your 2015 calendar and we were hoping to get some <laughs> today. <laughs> no, um, uh, you're a private sector and, and, and you know, I, I would like to know, Monique asked a question this, this morning, how do we get the private sector uh, in, 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 in our development agenda? What is the one motivation for, you know, what, what, what what drove you into this uh, thing? Okay, I'm going to take Monique and then I'm going to come over here so you'll Monique have four and, uh, questions. Are yeah. you tracking? Yes, I'm tracking. Um, not everyone was present yesterday when we had a very interesting meeting about the NAPAD program the, uh, together with NORAD. Um, I think there were about 20 people there. And um, I think one of the interesting things that came out of that discussion was the fact that um, NAPOD is trying to build on, let's say, uh, stronger women's organizations, stronger voice of women in decision making, and uh, not trying to, let's say, impose uh, criteria or impose uh, ways of working uh, from the top. And I think this is, this is a major achievement. And I, I get a little bit concerned when I hear people, sorry about this, um, people saying if women are, Illiterate women, you know, cannot build a business. I mean, in West Africa, I think most of the business women are illiterate, and some of them are Mama Benzes, who definitely can't read or write, but certainly know what they're doing. So I'm a bit concerned about, let's say, underestimating the capacities of women. Um, I'd just like to, uh, to take a quote from one thing that our minister said um, last year when we started working very much in the private sector. She said, women are crucial in the light against climate change. It had to do with how do we adapt to climate change. Uh, but let us not look at women as victims. Let us mobilize their potential as agents of change. And for me, that's the key word. Women take advantage of the power they have 
and even in societies that seem very repressive, often women do have a, a, an area of control, and uh, you know they 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 are and they can be mobilized as agents of change. And so she said, women should be at the center stage in our planning and programming at all levels. We need to build on their coping strategies, which I think is also another important issue. Sorry, I mean, uh, I have half a minute. <laughs> and enable them to participate in decision-making processes. So for me, this was a very strong message to say, believe in women, take them for what they are, use their coping strategies, and make sure that they can become their own agents of change. Thank you. Excellent. Thank and you, I'm Monique. And I'm going to take one more, and then we're going to come and to And one the more, and then we go back to the panel, yeah, and then yeah. we'll see. Yeah. Hi, uh, Mi Kim from Korea. Uh, it, I think it's really important to uh, to measure women's empowerment. It's sort of a um, and you suggested uh, about ten indicators or so on. Uh, I also want to recognize that UNDP has been published in Gender Empowerment Measurement Gem, and uh, there's a lot of overlap, similarities with what you have um, presented, which focused on decision making and leadership, uh, leadership uh, for women and so on. But the two things that I think are not mentioned is the, the income women make vis-a-vis -vis men doing the same kind of work. So the income gap is, uh, I'm quite interested whether you were able to measure that. The other thing is the, the share of formal versus informal unpaid labor. Women tend to be in the informal unpaid labor. Um, and I, I'm wondering in your women's empowerment uh, index, whether you were able to measure these items as well. Okay, so we have a, just, I think we need to, okay. we need to, okay. let's continue. So it's, there is another, let's say, uh, part of the afternoon here. Just four things about the integration between agriculture, food, nutrition, health, and how we're going to do that. There's an issue on do we believe enough in women that they can actually do the job here. A specific question, Lavanzo, from with address to, to, to Francesco, and your issue is to, let's say, the, the, the value of, of labor and the, uh, and the informal and formal. Could I give you each maybe two minutes to take on board what you should, could take on board to answer those four, four people in one go? Or one? So which question am I answering? Anyway, I just wanted to say something with respect to the issue that you raised, you know, that viewing women as agents of change and uh, not underestimating the skills that women have. I think that it's a very important issue, but we also have to recognize that um, it's, it's very challenging. So in some, and th there's a lot of differences across different regions. So the, for you to be an agent of change, you, first of all, I think you need to recognize, you know, um, um, Recognize that you're in need of something. Recognize that you want a change. And, and this is something that I'm very baffled, you know, every time I go around, you know, go to the field. So, for instance, I give an example. I was in, a, in the northern part of Mali, and there's so many USAID activities there, and some of them are there to um, improve food production, improve women's um, access to income. But in reality, you know, it's not happening. First, because the women don't see themselves as requiring any change. They're very content with the situation. And you ask them, what's your vision? Nothing. There are no schools, no roads, no access to markets. So it, that's when it's really challenging. For you as a donor, for you as somebody who thinks that you know, they need a change and they don't see that they need a change, it's, it's very difficult. So I, I just wanted to point out to that, you know, meanwhile, the other cases where, you know, women realize that they're in need of something, they realize their skills and the, the potentials that they have, and they're just looking for somebody that will help them organize better in order to, to get to where they want to be. So I, I think that it's, it's really important. And then the other thing that I um, wanted to talk about is, um, you know, I think I already mentioned, so bringing in the private sector. So we have a, an opportunity, and it's a requirement for us to get the private sector involved. You know, most of the time when people apply, apply for the grant, we ask them, you know, who are the people that you're working with on the ground? We want to know if they're involving private sector or other NGOs that are um, in the, you know, locally um, situated. And I think that for most of this private sector, they also want to see impact. 
there's a big test now. They want to be able to see the, the outcome, you know, the, the results of, of, of their involvement. Because if it's not profitable to them, it's, there's, there's no point. So I think that if we're more able to measure the impact, it will be easier, you know, it will be more, create more incentives for the private sector to, to get involved. Yes. You. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, let, sure. Yeah, well, I try, I try, I try. I try. Okay. So, let, let, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, oh, this is not, not a count on my time. Huh? Thank you for, uh, for your comments on the calendar. Uh, just one point. All the people in the calendar except one model from, from Ethiopia are real people. One of these real people is Mrs. Aznakesh Thomas. She's a grower in, uh, in, in Ethiopia. And besides being a fantastic uh, friend, she's a great entrepreneur. She makes a great coffee, makes money, and also helps the community. So, of course, with, with your point, let me make another observation on your point. In, in some of the cases in, in our project, there are some women participating, but many of these women are actually widows. So the question is, either the widow are smarter, which can be an opportunity, <laughs> an explanation, <laughs> or, 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 or actually means that is the family, let's say, um, family sociological constraint that are actually keeping the women in a certain position, not the capability or not the women. So for me, this is not a question. This is not an issue. The issue is no, if the women is or not good. There are plenty of, of cases where it is even much better, as in other cases, also the men are good. So that is not the, the, the point. The point, in my opinion, is really the situation, the environment, that is very, 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 very important to get on. The final word. The last but final word. I may have the last word on that. To, to you. Thank you. I'll try to be brief. Um, yes, I will. I'm going to try to go in order. So, um, Mark, I really do. Um, I completely agree with you that it's important to look at these crossover issues of agriculture, health, and nutrition, and um, we need to pay more attention to that, both in research and programming. Um, regarding your question about the UNDP index and our index, they're very, they're, they measure similar things but at a different level of aggregation. So the UNDP measures are based on published statistics, whereas ours are based on um, household and individual level data which are specially collected. So they're used for different things. Ours are, our index is, is very good for impact evaluation and monitoring and evaluation. So if you have a project and you want to find out what is the impact of your project on empowerment in these domains, that's what you would use. Because um, and the UNDP indicators would give you that nationally and using published statistics. So it's a, it's, it's a question of um, level of detail. Um, I just wanted to make a final comment on coffee because I actually thought that with Mario here, he would be distributing free samples of coffee and I was very disappointed it didn't happen. Um, but. I think an issue about women's land rights and coffee is that traditionally women have had, in women in this, and men within the same households have very different power over land. And women tend to have weaker rights over land. And what we have found out in Ethiopia um, is that even if women's land rights have been strengthened because of the least recent land registration, there is still a large gap in knowledge about um, their land rights, and this gap in knowledge has actually means that women are less likely to adopt climate smart agricultural practices or to plant trees like our favorite tree, coffee. And you can read more about it in this thing, on, in this uh, collection of, of policy notes on gender and climate change, the potential for group-based approaches. Thank you. Thank you. Three things for closing. First of all, yes, there is a lot of fine-tuning to be done. You'll find it here. It is great work you're doing here on the screen. Second is, I'm convinced there is a business case. There's a solid economic case to build on that, and we need to do that in partnership. We can't do that alone. You will need to reach out to others to do that together with you on the ground level. Third point is, I hope that if you go home, you know the one thing which you are going to do individually. If you want to do it collectively, that's fine here. Start simple. Take one thing you can do, which is feasible and practical in your area. Thank you very much indeed.